going to be speaking on the Internet of Things. And let me assure you, I'm not lying, guys. Okay, so, and I think this topic is uh, particularly uh, relevant in today's uh, theme of uh, TEDx, which is Catch the Wave. Uh, I would like to state, I mean, that uh, we are moving towards a more connected, more instrumented, and a data-driven world. I mean, we communicate all the time with our laptops, with our smartphones, with the iPads, iPods. I mean, <coughs> it's now uh, uh, said that we have close to around 7 billion devices connected to the internet for a total population of about 7 billion. And it is expected by the year 2016, this will reach almost 10 billion. And by the year 2020, this is going to reach almost 20 billion. And a large part of this number of devices that are going to be connected to the internet are going to come from two main technologies. One is the Internet of Things, and another one is possibly the smart grid besides our numerous mobile phones, etc. Now, before we go into what the uh, Internet of Things is, I would like to uh, bring your attention to a very interesting fact this year, year of 2013. This is the year of the Mahakum Mela. This occurs every once in 12 years, and um, this is an extremely important occasion for uh, a lot of Indians. And the uh, most interesting fact is, during from the period of January the 14th to March the 10th, it is expected that almost 100 million people will travel through the city of Allahabad for a dip in the Holy River uh, uh, <coughs> Sangam, which is a confluence of Ganges and the Yamuna. And an interesting uh, experiment is going to be taken this year by Harvard Business University where they're going to study this uh, mass human congregation. What they're going to do is, now these 100 million people, almost we can expect about 80 million will have mobile phones. And mobile phones with their sensors can act as location devices. So Harvard Business University, along with telecom operators, is going to gather data as the people move to the city of Allahabad. And what they hope to be able to get from this enormous amount of data that they gather is that you can probably you know be able to uh, look for signatures of probable disasters how are disasters avoided how do people you know interact during this thing because they're getting real-time data coming from the different mobile cell phones so and uh, there is an enormous amount of uh, information they're going to get and this they're going to analyze for the next couple of years and they're going to use some um, technique known as uh, big data to do this now, what is the Internet of Things? The first formal definition came from I ITUT, which is the telecommunication wing of the United Nations, in which they visualized a highly interconnected world with millions of devices which are either active, intelligent, or passive, and sensors which send a continuous stream of data toward, to the back end for processing through the Internet. It's also known as the machine-to-machine -machine communication and sometimes also known as pervasive computing or ubiquitous computing. Now, the ITUT, what they said was, you know, up till the year 2005, the way we communicated basically had three dimensions. We could have anyone talking to any, uh, at any time to, at, from any, to any, anybody else. Now, they had a fourth dimension where they said you can have anyone talking uh, anywhere at any time and you could now have a fourth dimension whereas you could have anything which is connected to the internet. So that is where the concept of Internet of Things is. You have four dimensions. You have not just people. You also have things, sensors, which are connected to the net and keep sending a continuous stream of data. The Internet of Things is, to give you a basic fundamental concept, it is basically millions of devices. Now, these devices can be either passive devices, or they can be intelligent devices, or you can have sensors, which sense the environment and keep sending data to the back end for processing uh, through the internet. And we can expect almost everyday articles, right, from you know your mobile phones to your toasters, tires, toothbrushes, all to be equipped with some sort of you know sensor which will send back data for processing at the back end. Now, radio frequency IDs. The early enabler of this Internet of Things technology came from the radio frequency IDs or the RFIDs. It is, an RFID is nothing but a, a simple tag which in the presence of an RFID receiver announces its own identity. So in the presence of a receiver, the RFID tag will tell, I am, my, ta I, my tag number is so and so. 
An interesting uh, history of this RFID tag is it was only used in World War II in the British uh, Spitfire aeroplanes uh, in the nose cone of the aeroplane and you would, you would have large antennas which would uh, detect a friend, the, the British aeroplanes from the enemy aeroplanes and take uh, appropriate action. Now this RFID uh, technology has been used in, in large retail stores like Walmart in the US and Tesco in the <coughs> UK. So what they did is in their central warehouses, they tag all their products with these RFID tags. And as these products move from their central warehouses to the regional warehouses, and from the regional warehouses to the retail stores, they have a running inventory of all the products as they move from the warehouses back to the retail store. And you, as you can see, as a person actually goes and picks up the products and as customers keep buying products, you will have a running count of the number of products that are there on the shelves. And if there's going to be a shortage, you can make sure that you can supplement the uh, shortage of products because you have a running inventory of all the products at your central warehouse, at your regional warehouse, and at your retail store. Now, uh, we could have a, a simple case where we could have an RFID uh, receiver uh, fitted to a a cart and as the customer keeps putting in products you can expect the all the products being automatically uh, the complete product list being generated even before the customer goes to the for his checkout so it would uh, save time there other interesting applications is where you could embed uh, it, uh, there's another interesting application where they're embedding sensors in tires uh, automobile tires and uh, these sensors will automatically detect if the tires are getting worn out and it will alert the drivers to go for a new set of tires. Payment of highway tolls, you don't have to stop at tolls and, uh, uh, and uh, pay, pay, pay change. You can have these RFID tags automatically deduct money from your RFID uh, devices. And we also have innovative ideas where insurance companies can give discounts to safe drivers. So drivers who are safe, who drive, don't drive rashly because they're getting continuous uh, data from these uh, device sensors on these tires. You can have this. Now, uh, uh, so now what is the Internet of Things? I want to just understand this concept and imagine a little bit. When you have objects that can sense the environment and can communicate, these, so let us suppose you have sensors in the environment which can keep sending a constant stream of data about the environment to the back end through the Internet for processing and analysis, then you can really respond quickly. Now I'm going to show you a small clip. This is from a movie called The Twister which came in the year 1996. So, device which they called as Dorothy in which they have filled a lot of sensors and these sensors can actually float with the wind and as they, they push it into the funnel of the uh, uh, category 5 hurricane it is able to give them a real-time visualization of the hurricane as it moves and in fact in the next scene it uh, they show that it actually goes towards these two people who are watching 
So you can, yeah, if you can have sensors that can sense the environment and communicate back to you with the data that they gather in real time, then you can do, you can really handle, uh, respond to tasks very, very fast. Okay, now so basically we, uh, we have a fourth dimension of intelligent devices that can capture data and take appropriate action. We can do multiple things when we have this uh, basic theme. That is you can forecast events ahead of time or you can take intelligent action based on the events. Okay, so this is the basic context of the Internet of Things. That is you have sensors or intelligent devices in the network which can sense the environment and send you back real-time data for processing through the Internet. Uh, to the back end. So based on this theme, I'm going to show you four major uh, implementations of the Internet of Things in today's world. Okay, now a very interesting uh, 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 concept came from Mark Wieser in 1991. He says the most profound technologies are those that disappear and into the very fabric of everyday life. That is in uh, everyday life, if, it, if we can uh, embed sensors, then it really helps us uh, uh, to uh, work this world, uh, to handle uh, things better. So the end of things in the world today, we have four major areas, smart city, smart grid, smart home, then uh, machine to machine and health. So quick, quickly, let's quickly look at smart city. What is smart city? In fact, a lot of uh, major organizations are working on the smart city, uh, like whether it's uh, IBM or Oracle or SAP or Siemens. What it does is, if you, uh, they have embedded uh, sensors and traffic signals and uh, vehicles, and they keep monitoring the data, and they have a central place where they can monitor the data, so they can actually see which roads are getting more congested, and based on that, they have uh, at the back end they have processing software called predictive analytics or big data, where they can analyze large streams of data in real time and can forecast. Uh, traffic congestion and uh, suggest alternate routes to drivers. In fact, there is a very interesting idea. Uh, there's a case study by some of the uh, organizations in some cities. What they did was they gave discount to drivers to use roads which are less crowded, but which are slightly longer. Okay, and you know they charge heavily for uh, the roads which are more congested, and they found that they could manage the traffic better on these cities. And. Uh, the next is smart grid. Uh, smart grid, in fact, is also coming now uh, to our own country. And uh, what the smart, uh, the, our regular grid, the electrical grid, is almost 100 years old. And basically, there are enormous uh, transmission, uh, basically consists of generation of electricity, transmission, and distribution. And large grids typically will have large losses when you transmit them, and you will have frequent outages and blackouts. Uh, in the year 2003. We had a blackout in the U.S. of all places, and that was the largest blackout in the U.S. Uh, U.S. history. And in uh, India, we had a blackout in the year last year, th July 31st, and almost 600 people were left powerless for the la for almost 24 hours. Now, what the smart grid does is you distribute sensors along the grid, all along the grid, and these sensors keep monitoring the grid as the uh, as the energy flows through it, and they can take action. Uh, based on any situation, they keep monitoring. And so what happens is, let us say you have uh, some, it, it, it is able to detect a fault in some area of the grid. The, these sensors will quickly localize the fault and isolate the fault and leave the other parts of the grid completely safe from this uh, outage. So there will not be a, a domino or a cascade effect which will result in a complete blackout for a lot of people. Okay, that basically increases your resiliency to uh, failures and it automatically reroutes energy. Assuming one part of the uh, network is you have a problem, it will reroute the energy. Smart home. Smart home is actually a, a part of the smart grid. Here what they do is they uh, have um, all your home appliances now have two-way sensors. It can uh, communicate to the far end. And as I don't know how many of you all know, the, the price of the energy, the electricity, it varies almost like a stock price. So what in a smart home, what they try to do is they try to make, uh, let's say, a washing machine instead of starting using it during the peak hours of the day, where the, uh, the cost of the energy is high, they will it will automatically start during the night where at off peak hours. Okay, so uh, you can monitor the energy usage and you can basically save money to the uh, to the uh, user, the home home homeowners. Uh, machine to machine and health. This is a really interesting thing. Now you can have devices that can be implanted in patients who are heart patients. 
and it can send uh, data about the patient's heart rate, pulse rate, blood pressure, etc., to a doctor sitting at the remote end, and the doctor can take action. Let us say he's, uh, he's going to enter into car cardiac arrest. The doctor can quickly call the patient and uh, advise him to take certain medications and prevent the heart attack, uh, any, any kind of heart, heart problems. So that is one, one thing. Another one is you can also uh, use it to monitor sugar levels and you know, uh, advise patients if, are, if the count is going very high. Structural integrity. Uh, this is another area. You could have sensors uh, put it on, on a bridge and it can, you know, at any time keep more continuously monitoring the stress on the uh, bridge and uh, give a kind of a warning in, in case the stress is too great and, you know, and a collapse is possible. So this, you can avoid any possible collapse in bridges. The use of internet uh, of things in mines, this is just a, a, a thought which I, I think it could be used. You could actually use sensors in the mines to, you know, to keep a real-time measure of the toxicity of the air, so you don't endanger the lives of the uh, the mine workers. So that is one thing. Or you could keep it to uh, forewarn on the possibility of flooding or things like that. Now, as I said, the Internet of Things uh, again to reiterate, uh, it is basically the uh, the ability to distribute uh, devices, intelligent devices, into your environment gather data in real time uh, and send it uh, through a back end, uh, through the internet for processing so at the, at the back end you will have to process this large amount of data when you have millions of uh, millions and millions of sensors you could have uh, almost terabytes of data so your regular uh, technologies uh, like servers will not be of much help so you need two major uh, companion technologies one is cloud computing and as you all know cloud computing is a new uh, uh, is a new trend now uh, so cloud computing is basically it can grow or shrink depending upon the the, data, the, the amount of uh, traffic flowing in and big data is basically enables you to analyze data in, in real time and take and, uh, and give you a possible point in which direction you, you should take action okay now so uh, what i want to say is the internet of things is the future it is here and pretty soon we are going to uh, it's going to come into your own neighborhood so i think uh, we can all be prepared that pretty soon we're going to see the end of things in our regular future, in our day-to-day -day lives. So that, that's all I have.